Well, hello, Lavington Vineyard Church, including those gathered here with our live audience today. Keribuni sana. It's great to celebrate the Lord's table with you today. In Acts chapter 8, we learn about Philip, who is one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church, was told by the Holy Spirit to go on this road from Jerusalem to Gaza. And as he's on the way, he's, he meets this man who is an Ethiopian eunuch who is actually the treasury secretary, if you will, of Ethiopia at that time. And this is what the eunuch was reading when Philip meets him. From Isaiah 53, He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? for his life was taken from the earth. Philip was able to explain to this man who was reading Isaiah 53 what this means, namely how Jesus Christ fulfilled that prophecy. And undoubtedly he went on to explain to this Ethiopian eunuch this portion from Isaiah as well. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That eunuch came to know the one who was made a substitute sheep for him. He was converted and baptized right there, and he undoubtedly went on to establish the church in Ethiopia. And that church over the centuries has had an impact on this continent. And that Ethiopian church, that infant church in Ethiopia would have come to gather around the Lord's table, perhaps using injera, this bread that we're going to use today. So you heard about this perhaps last week in Lily's sermon, where she talked about how from this grain called taif, we get Injera. And today, just as with the Ethiopian church, perhaps throughout centuries, has used this bread to signify the body of Christ given for us. And then, of course, the fruit of the vine signifying the blood of Christ shed for us. And so for those in our our live audience today, we're going to use this bread to signify the body of our Lord, this bread that goes back 6,000 years in human history. But for whatever bread or crackers or whatever you're using at home, or whatever drink, we remember what our Lord Jesus did for us. And so as we come to remember our Lord and Savior today, the Lord and Savior of Philip, and of that Ethiopian treasury secretary, let's say this prayer of confession together. And for those of you watching from home or wherever, you'll see it up on the screen. Let's say this together. Holy and merciful God, We confess that so often we are like those sleepy disciples. Instead of laboring in prayer, we fall into temptation. Instead of relying upon you, we seek our own way. Instead of seeking strength from you, we depend upon ourselves. Instead of your will, we insist on our will. We confess that we have been asleep in so many ways. But because Jesus labored in prayer for us, even sweating drops of blood, we have hope. Because of his blood shed on the cross, we now have access to you. Forgive us for not only falling into temptation, but sometimes diving into temptation. Thank you that Jesus is enough for us. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer of confession with a sincere heart, Know that our Lord Jesus Christ forgives you and he loves you. He has heard your confession. So rest in the knowledge of his grace today. And so now let's take a moment, just a few seconds, to examine our hearts before the Lord before we partake of the elements.
Amen. So the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's drink the cup together. You see, beloved, whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, whether in Kenya or Ethiopia or wherever in the world, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Philip. Thank you for that Ethiopian eunuch. Thank you for how your church has spread all over this world and wherever we are, whatever elements we're using to symbolize the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you for the gift of the cross and the resurrection. Thank you for this season of Lent that we're in, where we remember the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we've partaken of your supper, during this season especially, would you seal in our hearts what we've done today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So good morning, everyone. My name is Ben, and I'm really excited to be with you all today to talk about the Word. Um, we're beginning the next step in the, in the series on Luke, continuing what we heard last week about the Last Supper, the last time that Jesus was with his disciples, the time where he talked to them about, about being sifted like wheat, like tafe, like the injera we had a little while ago. This week, we're going to talk about the very next passage in Luke with Jesus making the hardest decision of his life for us. He's in a garden on his knees, crying out to his father, deciding just how far to go, just how far to take this. He decides to whether to do what he really set out to do. He decides to whether to go all the way. And in fact, the good news today is that he did go all the way. He did decide to continue. And here's my main point at the very beginning. We should go a little bit farther. We should go a little bit farther. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, thinking about this, uh, this, this scene in a garden like this, where Jesus decided to go all the way, and we can go farther in prayer, we can go farther towards him. He's calling you to go one more step, and that's what we're going to get to today. But before we do that, remind you last week, you, uh, you heard from my beautiful wife, so I want to take you back to our, our wedding day. I won't tell you, tell you how many years ago it was. My children are making fun of just how long we've been married. Thanks, babe. 22. That's one. That's good. We got married in July in South Carolina. So let me tell you what July in South Carolina is like. It's a hot time <laughs> in a hot place. <laughs> so my 12 best friends like you were, uh, were my groomsmen. Uh, that was a tribe of Benjamin. We had 12 of us. Actually, it's actually not true that they were my best friends. I actually don't. I hope they're not all listening today because I was marrying into a Ethiopian family and she definitely had 12 friends and cousins that were really close. I honestly did not have 12 friends. So like eight of them were my friends. Four of them are just, I was just picking up off the street just before we got going because you can have a mismatched number of, uh, of groomsmen and bridesmaids. So I had eight good friends and so 12 people in the room getting ready for the, the wedding day. So it's the morning. We all had our tuxedos. I opened up the tuxedo case and it was the wrong tuxedo. There were 13 tuxedos. 12 of them were right. One of them was wrong. The one that was wrong was mine. So this was two hours before our wedding which in Ethiopian diaspora terms means like four or five hours before we had the actual wedding time. So I had time enough. So I looked at my 12 groomsmen, my eight closest friends, and I had to pick someone who I could trust to take me to the mall to switch out uh, my tuxedo. So I took my best friend, my very best friend, Kenny, and we went, uh, we got in the car trying to rush uh, to get our tuxedo. 
Um, and he was, he was really good about keeping me in good spirits. said, don't worry, these Ethiopians are always late. You won't miss it. I, you know, because she's a beautiful, wonderful woman. Like if I missed the Mindo to marry her, I'd really regret it. So he's like, really, Ben, don't worry. They're really not going to be on time. So, you know, we started to calm down a little bit about that. And then I notice the fuel gauge. You know, there's E and then there's below E. I was below E. So we got to the hill and I said, okay, let me just save the gas. So I took it out of gear and just coasted down into the valley. And like, you can see the mall right there, but then there's another hill coming up. And so I put it back in gear, just gave it a little gas and gone. So we just <laughs> sputtering along and guess what happened on my wedding day, two hours before wedding time, I ran out of gas on the side of the road. Now, as you can see here, I am, I am prone to sweating. So I'm in like my tuxedo pants and the shirt. It was, it was the tux itself, the top and the vest that was wrong. So I was outside of the car because you can't stay in a car in South Carolina. You know, you're going to burn. So we get out of the car. It's two black dudes in South Carolina outside of a car looking really shady two hours before my wedding day. Okay. So we're going to pray for 22 year old Ben, who was very stressed at that moment. And we're also going to pray for our sermon. We'll get back to that story in a minute. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, we do pray. We do ask. We do uh, request you to be here with us. We ask for your strength and helping us to go farther, to go another step, to go with you. We thank you, Lord, for this passage we're going to read today about what you did, the decision you made, the hardship you decided to go through because you loved us so much. And I pray, Lord, as we're hearing from you today, that we be called by your spirit to go another level, another step for you. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Thank you for these good people here being able to worship together in person. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to go to Luke 22, verse 39 to 46. We're going to actually go pretty deep into the Word today, so we'll go verse by verse in a moment. And I'm really excited about getting to do that. So this is verse 39. You'll see it on your screen. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he went back to his disciples. He found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Powerful passage that, again, I think is the biggest, hardest time that Jesus had in his 33 years on this earth. Let's look at verse 39 together first. It says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. Verse 39, there was a place he went as usual. It says normal spot. So the reason why, keep in mind that he had just come to Jerusalem a little while ago. He went to Jerusalem around the time of Passover as a big feast. During the time of Passover back then, three times the population of Jerusalem were in the city. So as you see on the picture, it's a crowded spot. So Jesus didn't want to be there in the evenings. He walked a couple hours actually away from Jerusalem to this place called the Mount of Olives. It was the normal place for them to go while they were in this kind of Passover period in the evenings. He needed a place to escape. Anybody else need a little place to escape? When it comes, you guys are maybe working from home, but even in your house, you need a place to escape. There's a place where you meet with God, right? And mine is in that bedroom uh, right up there. Uh, or at lunch times when I'm uh, praying out here in, in the backyard. When I, every time I would go back uh, to my hometown, I would go to my elementary school and have a, a chat with God in the evenings about, about my life. Whenever I have a vacation, I have a little time with myself or with my youngest daughter where we stand at the beach and look at the ocean and just, just hear from God. I also have a time with God right before I get in an airplane because why would a bus filled with people fly? So there's also like, forgive me of all my sins in case this one is the one goes down. So what's your, what's your place? What's your normal spot to talk with God, right? I think it's really important to have one. 
Verse 39, his place was the Mount of Olives. Now, this same passage is, is presented in both Matthew and Mark. And in Matthew and Mark, it gives the name of the overall Mount of Olives, or this place where they have olive trees. And there's a particular portion of the Mount of Olives called Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. So this story happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. Can I tell you something about Gethsemane? Gethsemane is literally a word that means pressing oil, okay? Gethsemane, press oil. So this part of Gethsemane, this part of this overall olive grove where all these olives were, this little part had an olive press. An olive press is the thing that you take the olives and you crush them. The olive that, we, that tastes good, you, you push it down until it turns into olive oil, okay? So where he prayed, Gethsemane was the place that you take olives and you crush those olives until those olives become olive oil. Now on, this, on the video, you see the picture of what an olive press looks like. But for you who are here, I'll demonstrate. It's a circular thing, right? The olives are like around the corners here. And what you do is you take this metal thing and you roll it around. And as you're rolling it around, olive, Jeremy, olive, Eric, Olive, Lily get crushed over and over. They get a little crushing period, then they get to rest. They come back around, get a little crushing period, and they get to rest. Okay, that's what an olive press is. It's a circular, round by round process of crushing the olives into olive oil. Okay, now without going too deep into the analogy, that's what was happening to Jesus and to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were getting crushed from olives into olive oil. There's pressure sometimes. There's pushing sometimes. There's change sometimes that happens in your life that will turn you from the nice olive into the, 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 the powerful oil. You know all the uses that they had for oil back then? They, they, they used it for cooking. They used it for praying. They used it even as a way to trade. That oil was more valuable than the olives. And the oil only comes after it gets pressed, after it gets crushed, after it gets smushed down. People, we need to get, we need to go through the pressing to become the oil that God wants us to be to make a difference in this world. Amen? And many of us, you get the little bit of pressing, you're like, look, that's all I want. <laughs> but God wants the oil to be pressed again, to be pushed down again. And in fact, it's in the decisions that happen as you're getting pressed that you become what God wants you to be. And here's the temptation. I'm getting off my sermon, but I tell you, the temptation is as after it hurts a little bit too much, when it's a little bit too hard to say, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but that's all the pressing I can take. And that was actually the temptation that Jesus himself went through, stopping the press, going halfway, and giving up. Verse 40, on reaching this place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. So prayer is the thing that defends you from temptation. Prayer is a thing that helps you to resist temptation. Temptations differ. We're all dealing with different ones. But the key temptation in this passage for Jesus and for those disciples was turn to turn back before the job was done. The key temptation was to stop and go only halfway. You remember just a little while earlier in the same passage of Luke, when Jesus is telling his disciples that he was going to die, their response was, surely not, Lord. Right? You've done all these good things, but surely not all the way to death. It's the halfwayness that's the temptation. I've just coined a word. <laughs> halfwayness that's the temptation. To be a believer but not go all the way. To be a believer, but stop that oil press from coming around again. The, for the disciples, if you think about what happens in the days to come, the temptation was to give up and decide all of this wasn't really real. In fact, that's the purpose of the book of Luke. It was written to disciples who had, had been waiting for Jesus to come back and he hadn't. And the, and the temptations had gotten bigger because the pushback from the community, the pushback and the resistance to Christianity was getting bigger. For them, the temptation, the readers of Luke was to go halfway. For the disciples who were worried about what this word from Jesus about him dying meant, the, 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 the temptation was to go halfway. The temptation was to say, no, I don't know him. Peter style, right? No, 
I don't know him. No, I wasn't with him. The temptation is to go halfway, to see the situation through human eyes. This was a, a Jesus who came on a donkey, anointed with people crying, Hosanna. He's supposed to be the king. And so from my point of view about what human eyes would say would happen, right? Is that I'm expecting this Jesus to be a king. And you're talking about a guy who's about to die. I'm expecting this. And this is what's happening. So isn't that our temptation? The plan we had for our lives, the plan we had for our situation isn't how it's working out. So the temptation say, oh, really? I expected God to be a king in the way that my mind understood it, not the way that God was planning it. Who's tempted a little bit like that right now to only go halfway? So stop right now to give up right now because it's hard. That obstacle means, oh, it can't be God. But let me tell you, that obstacle means it's God turning you from an olive into olive oil. Raise your hand right now if you're going to not stop, if you're going to not go halfway, if you're going to push through and decide, yes, one more time, I'm willing to push. I'm, I'm serious. Raise your hand I, on the video too. Verse 41, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. By the way, back in Israel in, at, in that time, you prayed standing up. We think about praying kneeling, but back then they typically prayed standing up. So him kneeling down was because of the burden on him, right? It wasn't the holy style of praying. It was a style of praying that admitted how much Jesus was going through. Now, 41 says that Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw. Now, how far can you throw a stone? <laughs> it's not that far. It's probably just about right there, right? But Jesus needs to be by himself. He needs to go a little bit farther. He needs to go away from these disciples who have gone with him so, so, so far. In verse 28 in the same chapter, uh, Jesus called these disciples the ones that had stood by him through his trials. So he already appreciated these disciples. But there was a selection process amongst the disciples. Watch this, right? There were 12 disciples. He left one behind. Why? <laughs> because he was about to betray him. That's Jesus, Judas. It doesn't say that in the Luke passage, but in the Mark and Matthew passage. There are 11 disciples who came with him to the Mount of Olives, but eight of them stayed at the gate and never entered the Garden of Gethsemane. He only took Peter, James, and John inside of the Garden of Gethsemane. So you had 12, you brought eight, but then he only took from the eight Peter, James, and John. Okay, So there is a, a, a process of deciding who is with me from the 12 to the 11 to the eight to the three. And even amongst the three, I need to go one more stone's throw beyond. Every group of these disciples didn't quite go far enough, right? Judas left him. The eight disciples were there, but not far enough. The three disciples were there, but they got sleepy. Here's my question to you. When you lay out the 12, the eight, the three, where do you find yourself now when it comes to going far with God? Where would you, where would you place yourself? How far will you go with Jesus in prayer? Here's my question. Can you go a little bit farther than you normally would? Can you go a little bit farther than you've gone in the past? If you see yourself amongst the eight, can we go a little farther to be one of the three? If we see ourselves as one of those Peter, James, and John, that were fighting to stay awake, fighting to overcome our sorrow, can we push a little bit farther? We'll talk about it in a minute. Jesus is not criticizing them, so to speak, about their weakness. He doesn't criticize, he's not yelling at you because you fell asleep. He's with you, but he's asking you to go another stone's throw, a little bit farther with him. Can we do that? Let's look at how he prays. Verse 42, this prayer is powerful. 42 says, Father, that's the first part. It's a four-part prayer. Let's go for the first part of that four-part prayer. Father, Abba, that's the word in Aramaic. That's how um, uh, Ethiopians call their daddy. Right? The literal word in Aramaic was Abba. He's saying, my father, the one I love, the one I'm close to. When we pray, pray to overcome temptation, you address your father with, with comfort, with connection, with closeness. My daddy, right? You know how your, your, your daughters in particular, they know how to like modulate their voice to talk to their daddy. You know, you know how it is, kid. You come and talk to your dad, daddy. There's a particular voice we use with God when we're really talking to him. Father. Number two, second part, if you are willing, <laughs> right? 
prepping yourself for submission. <laughs> like you're about to make your big request, but you're prepping yourself for submission if you are willing, if you'll do it, right? Number three, take this cup from me. So that's the big request that Jesus makes. What does take this cup from me? It depends how we understand the word cup. If you use the, ter- the, the passages from Psalm 75, Isaiah 51, Jeremiah 25, Revelation 14, the cup is a cup of suffering. It's a cup of wrath. What he's asking God, the Father, to take away from Jesus, the Son, is the, the torture he's about to go through. The fact that he would have to die and be tortured on our behalf. He is literally asking his Father, do I have to do this? Is there another way? To go through this. I know you guys might have heard that again, but I want you to imagine, sorry, you might have heard it before, but I might, want you to imagine Jesus, our Lord, actually praying to the Father, Father, is there any other way but this? The cup is suffering, it's the, it's the pain, it's the sorrow, and Jesus didn't want to do it. Many of you, when you talk to God, you need to be honest about what you don't want to happen, the situation you're in that you would like to stop. We have a God who is willing and able to listen to your request and hear what you're asking him. But here in verse 42, this is, I think, the crux of the passage. After he prays, saying, may this cup be taken away from me. This is where he decided at this point to go through it. You can imagine the unspoken communication back from the Father to Jesus about you and you and me. That no, no Jesus, no son, there's no other way because you love her and love him so much. That's the only way to die. You know that? Him uh, bleeding tears. The only reason he decided to go through is because of us. There was no other possible way. There was no other path. This is where his love for us and his decision to surrender was most evident. Now, I want you to notice, this is his moment of weakness, his moment of honesty. Once he decided in this prayer that take this cup, but I know there's no other way, he didn't stop again. In just a moment, he's captured, right, by the soldiers. And a moment after that, he's beaten. And a moment after that, he carries his cross. And a moment after that, he's mocked on the cross itself. And at no time did he stop and give up. It's because when he was in that garden and he asked his father, will you take this from me? And he realized there was no other way. He hardened, he he set his face like flint and decided I'm going to go through it. So when we pray and we get the answer from God, we set our face like flint and we decide to go through it because our Jesus did. So many worse things happen in the coming days than what he was experiencing right then. But because in his prayer to God, he decided this is the way. He decided that day. He stuck to it and he went through what had to happen for us and for his love for us. Verse 42, the model of requesting that those sufferings, those challenges, those hardships, the pain ahead goes away isn't just a model for us. It's a mo- sorry, a model for him. It's a model for us. We can ask God to take away the hardship, the loneliness some of you are feeling. It's okay to tell God, Lord, take that away. He might say yes. He might say yes. He doesn't say yes to Jesus, but he might say yes to us. But before we finish our prayer, we go to the end of verse 42. Yet not your will, sorry, not my will, but yours be done. You submit again, asking God to help you deal with whatever it is that he decides you're supposed to go through. Verse 30, 43, right after that, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Lily preached last week that Jesus was praying for his disciples. And in that prayer, he trusted that God would give them strength. Shortly thereafter, as he's praying to his father, an angel comes to strengthen the Lord. Now, I'm not sure what that looks like for you. I'm not sure if you had an angel come and strengthen you. But it, uh, we, we might not have angels at his beck and call like Jesus does. But he is there. He himself is there to strengthen us. He himself is there to give us the power we don't have in him. Strengthen yourself in prayer so that you can go a bit farther. That's the theme of today. It's strengthening him so he can go one more step so we can continue on. Verse 44, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The thing I want to emphasize here is that the angel's strengthening doesn't take away 
the anguish. The angel strengthening was verse 43, but in verse 44, he's still in anguish. It's this idea of the oil press, right? You get a pressing down and you get a break for a while, but it might come back again. Right? You still have to push through. Some of us have struggled to push through in our prayer life, struggled to push through in our relationship with God. Verse 45, when he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. What are they exhausted? What do they sorrow about? What are they sorrowful about? They're sorrowful about how it affects them, right? That they had given all this up for them. They had dropped their boats. They had left behind their jobs. And they would decided to follow him. But now he's about to die. It's going to affect me. They're sorrowful about themselves. We are so often stuck in how this bad situation affects us. And how hard it is for us. As opposed to what Jesus was going through. We're sorrowful and sleepy because we focus on us rather than on him. But let's focus on Jesus. Amen? Let's go one more step and hold on to him. By the way, for some of you who are really struggling with sorrow, it's okay to be struggling with sorrow and challenge. Hold on to the sorrow by holding on to him. You can make it through the pain you're in if you hold on to Jesus again. In verse 45, it doesn't say it in the, the Lucan gospel, but in Matthew and Mark, he adds this phrase, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? And I don't read that as a criticism, but a fact. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Can you speak to that in your own life? I want to do more, but it's hard. In this idea of struggling through God to God in prayer, he knows that your flesh is weak. And this message and this passage is a reminder to go a little bit farther. If you were the eight at the, at the gate, go a little bit farther into the garden. If you're amongst the three that he chose, go a little bit farther. A stone throw away to him. Go a little bit farther. He knows how hard it is. Verse 46, I love this verse. I realize that it's the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples as a group. Right? There's all these other things that happen in the, in the garden with the cutting off the ear and all. This is his last instruction to the disciples as a group. What does he say? Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you may, will not fall into temptation. And here's the amazing part about this. This is not my passage, so I'm stealing from the person preaching next week. But before he finishes, Judas and the soldiers come. So they actually don't have the opportunity to fulfill this last command from Jesus because Judas and them come and he's captured. Are you with me? So who's that word for? It's for us. We have the opportunity to follow that last thing, to get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Note that these are the last words that he spoke to them. And it's a word for us right now. Get up and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Go a little bit farther with Jesus so you resist what's happening. Let's go back to young Ben, 22 years old, in the hot South Carolina sun, somewhat like today. 90 minutes now before his wedding with a broke down car. I had my eight closest friends. I picked my one who was with me. And by that time, we started to get a little bit irritated because the part I didn't tell you earlier was that there was a car ahead of us, which was my wife and his wife, going to the mall together. But they didn't notice that our car had broken down. So we were on the side of the road expecting for my, his young wife and my wife-to-be would come and pick us up. This was pre-cell phones, but there were no wives coming to pick us up. We were there for a good little while. So we were all both getting a little bit, you know, shall we say, Irritated that we're out there in the hot sun. We're about to miss our wedding because they didn't notice that we hadn't come. Unbelie unbelievably, uh, 90 minutes before the wedding, a middle-aged white lady from South Carolina pulled up behind us. Now, when the car came, we didn't know if it was a police. We didn't know if it was someone to come rob us. But out hopped this bubbly 45-year-old white lady to run up to these two black dudes in the sun with a two-liter bottle of fuel. She had driven past us, seen us on the other side of the road, and said, let me go stop at the gas station and get these two random black people. I don't know a bunch of gas so they can go on their way. This to me is probably the first time I think I've met an angel. I'm not sure if it was really a South Carolina or an angel. Uh, I knew that uh, actually we got enough gas to get my tux and get back 
And lo and behold, we still had two hours before the wedding happened. <laughs> so here's the idea. We talked about my friends, the 12, the eight, and the one. And that one really did his best <laughs> to be there for me. Here's my point. Think of yourselves and Jesus, <laughs> right? You're probably not like Judas, but maybe you're like the eight who were stuck at the gate and didn't go in and pray with Jesus. Or you're maybe like the three who wanted to. <laughs> they really tried to pray. <laughs> they, in, the, in the Luke and the, sorry, in the Mark, Mark and Matthew gospel, he wakes them up a bunch of times. Like, yeah, yeah, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I'm praying. But this, while the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. But he's telling us again, pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Go a little farther. Do a little more. Try a bit harder this time. Amen? I want to uh, share this closing illustration with you. Um, it's from a book that uh, I just read called The Warmth of Other Suns. It's about um, the great migration in the U.S. African Americans, ex-slaves who were coming from the South to the North. My ancestors, <laughs> right? And uh, imagine this, this picture. There's a very beautiful scene in there of a, a, a sharecropper who runs away from his master, so to speak. And he knows he has debts. He knows he's supposed to pay this stuff, but he's trying to get on the train to get to the north. There's the nerves, there's the worry, there's the hiding. But he like, he sees the train, but he sees the guy who's looking for him and the decision whether or not to go a little farther and jump on that train and risk it to go up to the north and try and make a new life. It's not a beautiful life. He became a factory worker, right? He tried his hard and, you know, it was hard, hard work. But that decision to go a little bit farther to push himself a little bit more. I wouldn't be here today if my ancestors had not decided to jump on that train and leave behind that old life and to go a bit farther to God. And I bet for some of us, there's a little bit farther, there's a train that you can jump on to go a little bit farther to God. Amen? You can be fearful of what you're giving up. You can be worried about that next press from God, but let's hold on one more time so that we can turn from olives into olive oil. I've got three things for you to do. As application, as we close, number one, remember, find your place to pray. For Jesus, it was this garden. For me, it's this spot right here or my room up there. What's your spot where you and, you, you and your God talk? And today, what's the spot where you and your God talk about going a little bit farther, continuing on, pushing past your flesh, pushing past your challenge? Number two, Jesus' prayer to his Father was honest about his struggles. My second application for you is to tell somebody about your struggle. To admit to someone, I am dealing with it and it's hard. Please pray for me. Are you hearing me? That's my challenge to you. Find somebody to be honest about your struggles. I've gotten good friends who have found non-church places that they can be more honest about their struggles than we are. Find someone around. If you're watching on a video, maybe it's somebody here in the room that you're watching this with, but find someone to tell about your struggles. It's important. Number, number three is to do this four-step prayer that Jesus did in one sentence. Number one, address your father tenderly. Abba, my daddy. Number two, prepare yourself for submission if you are willing. Number three is the key. Tell him what you really are asking for what your heart's cry is. And number four, tell him, <laughs> not your will, not my will, but yours be done, right? Be honest with where you are, ask him, but be ready for, for the, the chance and the opportunity to follow him, no matter what he says, amen? amen. As we close, I wanna remind you, it's our task today to fulfill this last main command to the disciples, to go a little farther, to pray again so we don't fall into temptation. So if you're one of the eight, to become one of the three. If you're one of the three, to go that stone's throw farther in prayer. Amen? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you, Lord, for what you decided to do in that garden. We thank you, Lord, for the decision you made to go through with it, to do what you didn't want to do because you loved us so much. It reminds us again we have a God who saw me in that garden, who saw my life, that there was no other way to fix. There was no other way to bring me close to him than to die on that cross and to go through what comes ahead. 
but you saw me, you saw the people on this video, you saw the people here in the garden today, and you decided that she is worth it and he is worth it. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, for choosing us and thinking of us and deciding to go through the brokenness and the distance and the pain for us. And in return, Lord, we hear this command today that you are asking us to pray so that we will not fall into temptation, to go a little bit farther with God, to go one more round on this olive press so you can squeeze us from being halfway of what we're supposed to be to being all of what we're supposed to be. So help each one of us to do one of these steps, to do these steps to go farther in you. I thank you, Lord, for my groomsmen, <laughs> for the 12 of them, for the eight that I'm close to, and my good friends who stuck with me, Lord. And I have, pray that that would be an example of what we are with you. We stuck, we hold on, we continue, we, we stay strong in you. We pray so that we do not fall into temptation. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the strength that we don't have. We thank you, Lord, that is even though you, to, that you hear and see that our spirits are willing. Right now, my spirit is willing to go farther, even if my flesh is weak. I pray that you strengthen my spirit, just like you did with Jesus in the garden, that you gave him an angel to strengthen him. Strengthen us to continue on. Strengthen us today. We thank you, Lord, for being here and for loving us and for LVC and the people we love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless.